Great. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited today. We have been doing a series of Facebook Live conversations, and today we're also adding YouTube and Instagram to the lineup because we have a very, very special guest. Uh, we're trying to get information out to the public as everybody's lives have changed completely, and we know that many, many um, facets of our lives are, are totally upended by COVID-19 and this pandemic. Um, so today we're joined by Bill McKibben, who is a nationally, globally known leader when it comes to climate activism, the, for, the person who wrote the first ever kind of popular book about what climate change meant um, you know, back then, described as the greenhouse effect, and since then has been advocating, organizing, teaching, writing, and we're really excited that we get to spend a little time with you today, Bill. Well, Councillor Wu, what a pleasure to get to join you. And I, just let me say first, so many thanks for your good work. Uh, people know about it, and even outside the hub, people know about it. Uh, you know, what you're doing is really getting noticed, and we're really grateful for it. So thank you very much. No, thanks. And, um, you know, we, as you say, we in Boston like to think of ourselves as the hub of the universe, right? We, we often say that there's always a Massachusetts connection, but I actually learned in your case, there really is a Massachusetts connection as well. So you're you're coming to us from up in Vermont right now, you know, in, in your car, closer to where there's better service. Uh, but tell us about your ties to, to where I am. Well, now I grew up outside of Boston uh, in Lexington, um, where I got my sort of early political education because I used to give tours of the Battle Green uh, when I was in high school. So I've never... It was good for me. I never grew up thinking that there was some disconnect between patriotism and dissent. You know, I, I understood that they were the same thing. And then when I was in college, I covered uh, local politics a lot um, in Cambridge and Boston. And I, you know, I've I've spent a lot of hours in the uh, uh, in that big, somewhat ugly office building where you work. Uh, <laughs> I remember the first time I, I believe it's there. one of the most beautiful buildings <laughs> in the world. I remember the first time I was there, I, I'm so old that uh, I was in, uh, as a young reporter, in Mayor Kevin White's office the uh, night of his last re-election. So um, um, I have a good sense of, of, a little bit of sense anyway, of Boston, which is just, I think, my favorite city in the world. It's where my daughter and uh, her fiancé live. And and really, where my I mean, well, look, I, I, I live in New England, so all of us, uh, you know, like salmon, uh, <laughs> swim towards Boston every once in a while. Uh, I make the trip at least once a year from the further corners of Red Sox Nation into Fenway Park just to be at the heart of New England for a little while. So very, very good to get to talk to you. Yeah, we're glad to help you make this virtual trip back and you're, you know, you're ready and your your EV <laughs> is on the way. Um, and yeah, I, I had known theoretically or, you know, from your Twitter and, and other comments that you had ties to Lexington, but it really hit home when um, I received an email about this from former state representative Alice Wolf, oh. one of the progressive icons of Massachusetts. And she mentioned that she had gotten to know, know you when you were uh, in charge of the Harvard Crimson. And she I think she was on the school Cambridge, school, the Cambridge committee school committee. That's right. Back in the so day. I think the representative is watching and tuned in right now. And, and she sent in her questions, too. Um, so let's dive right in. I mean, we um, are in the midst of what is certainly a, a public health crisis, first and foremost. And we hear a lot on the government and policy side. You know, this is unprecedented. We hear on the economic side, the number of people filing for unemployment, what's happening with the markets. Uh, people keep using unprecedented, unprecedented. But in some ways, it feels very familiar, too, right? And you had mentioned when we were just chatting before that, you know, there are some things that, that this has reminded you of, Katrina and others. So, you know, just tell us, what sure. what does this remind you of, this moment right now? So if there's an unprecedented nature to this, it's that it's happening everywhere in the world at once, you know, and that really is different. Usually crises and disasters happen one place at a time. But, you know, I, I wrote the first book about climate change 31 years ago now. So I've had a long time to kind of anticipate and then watch the set of disasters that have begun to befall the world. Um, and 
each one of them causes chaos of an enormous order. So for New Orleans, it was Katrina. For New York City, it was Sandy. For the people of Australia, just three months ago, it was bushfires so horrible that thousands and thousands of people were standing in the ocean to keep from being burned to death. Um, 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 and these are the places that we know about because they have cameras, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, all over the world, the, the kind of iron law of climate change and really the mm -hmm. iron law of disaster is, the poorer and more vulnerable you are, the worse it is. I'm, we're beginning to understand that that's as true of coronavirus as it is of anything else. As the numbers begin to leak out, it becomes extraordinarily clear that it's people of color and poor people who are dying at much higher rates. That should come as no surprise, uh, you know, because these people who often live beyond the reach of medical systems whose health is not good to begin with and who have had to live in places uh, uh, dominated by among other things, polluted air, which we now know uh, is a huge contributing factor to how hard you get hit when you come in contact with this microbe. So it, it's, it's not unprecedented and it's not the last disaster we're ever going to have either. Um, once we're through this, uh, we need to deal with the fact that we've got uh, a, a predictable chain of disasters coming at us from climate change that will go, uh, well, I mean, it, 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 it will dominate uh, your lifetime and, and, and we can get, we can make those less bad than they have to be. Mm -hmm. We can't stop them anymore. You know, there's going to be bad global warming no matter what we do because we waited a long time. And one of the lessons from this coronavirus crisis that I think is sinking into people is timing counts. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're, we watched we watched the U.S. and South Korea have their first death on the same day in January. The South Koreans went to work. They disrupted their lives. They said people can't meet in big groups. We're going to test everybody, so on and so forth. And it was disruptive, but not unbelievably horrible. And as a result, they're now looking at this kind of in the rearview mirror. In the US, we took just the opposite tack. Our leader pretended that somehow it was all going to go away or the cases were going to drop to zero or by Easter, everything would be fine or you know, on and on and on. And so we didn't do things. Then when we finally had to do things, those things had to be really huge and tens of thousands of people are gonna die anyway. Um, we're, we didn't, to use the jargon we're all familiar with now, flatten the curve. Mm -hmm. uh, and we didn't flatten the carbon curve either. 30 years ago, there were fairly modest things we could have done that would have made a huge difference. And we didn't do them, mostly because the oil companies uh, set up a kind of disinformation machine to keep us from doing them. And so now we're in a position where the changes we're going to have to make are much larger. You know about that because you've been figuring out this Green New Deal policy for Boston. You know that those changes can be beneficial too, but that doesn't mean that any of this is going to be easy at this point. Yeah, no, it's, I, th I think it's, as you're saying, almost the exact copy paste and, and expansion and slightly editing of the time scale of okay. both the inequities the deepening of it, the, you know, the longer you wait, the more you have to do. And we're seeing now with coronavirus in particular that what you have to do is not only, you know, more expensive at that point, but it also, you know, with this virus has greater impacts, disproportionate costs back again on the same communities that were already um, yep. facing injustices prior to this. Yep. Which is one of the reasons why, I mean, it's clear that, <laughs> it's clear that we're going to have to restart our economies at the other end of this. It would make enormous sense, obviously, to restart our economies so that we were thinking about the next crisis down the road and dealing with climate change. And that's what places like South Korea and Germany are doing. They're in essence talking about Green New Deals as their economic recovery plan. But in our case, it would also make enormous sense to make sure that that recovery is not only green, but fair and just. 
you know. Um, the two things that have spiked in the last, well, really in my lifetime in this planet are temperature and inequality. Mm -hmm. and those two things are linked and we've got to solve them at the same time. We've got to deal with them at the same time because if there's anything that the coronavirus crisis makes clear, it's that we need, desperately need, a kind of social solidarity that we don't have in this country at the moment. For 40 years, you know, our leaders have been telling us that, you know, uh, markets solve all problems. And I mean, look, Ronald Reagan rose to glory by saying the nine scariest words on the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. Well, you know, that's just, I mean, the scariest words in the English language are, we've run out of ventilators, you know? Okay. Um, 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 we need to be able to work together as societies. To, and, and you can't do that if five people in your country have as much money as the bottom 150 million people. It's just ridiculous. So let's talk about that solidarity now and in this context, because what's also been incredibly painful is that we are watching people we care about. We're watching frontline workers, communities really sort of put, putting their bodies, their health, their lives on the line for this. And the rest of us where we traditionally might have been able to go volunteer somewhere, you know, gather together, um, come together, you know, protesting something that some injustices that we're seeing are now restricted to screens and, and being at home. So how, yes. how should we think about advocacy in the time of COVID? So let's think about that in a few ways. One, you're absolutely right. The strangest thing about this crisis is we have to suppress our natural instinct to go help each other, you know? Rebecca Solnit, an old friend of mine and one of the greatest writers in our country, wrote a remarkable book three or four years ago called Paradise Built in Hell, where she looked at one disaster after another back to the San Francisco fires in 1906. And what she found was that in every single case, people came together really before governments could do anything. People came together to solve. You remember those pictures from Katrina, you know, the government's completely useless, and but people are showing up with bass boats, you know, to rescue people off the roofs of houses, the Cajun Navy. You know? um, and that always happens. And that can't happen this time. All we can do is stand on our balconies and applaud the you know, healthcare workers who have no choice but to be brave and go into the fray. So that it really is hard. And one of the places that's really hard is that we can't engage in basic civic action. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is very sad because the bad guys are exquisitely good at taking advantage of moments like this to get things done. My really dear friend, Naomi Klein's book, uh, The Shock Doctrine of five or six years ago, was the perfect description of what's going on now. And I'll tell you the story that just, I mean, I, I try hard because I've been at this so long and because you have to kind of meter your anger and, and frustration, it's hard not to get mad. But last week it emerged that the Keystone Pipeline, which we've been fighting all across the country, led by indigenous groups and frontline communities in the Midwest, uh, for a 10-year battle, we've kept this thing from being built and it wasn't gonna get built. There was no way to get it built uh, until the pandemic came along. And then under the cover of that, the government of Alberta put up several billion dollars and Chase Bank led a bond issue for another couple of billion. And the, uh, 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 the company building it, the oil company building it, started flying in workers from all over America into rural areas, which have terrible health systems to begin with, and onto the edge of Indian reservations. I mean, these people could easily be carrying the coronavirus. Right. And they're, they're on places where people have lost 90% of their ancestors over the last 500 years to pandemic, you know? And, and 
and they're doing it because we can't stop them. We have 30,000 people who are trained to do nonviolent civil disobedience to stop the Keystone Pipeline. But we're not going to go out and do it now because we're smart enough to know that you can't, you can't flood the jails because if you take a germ into the jail, well, people there can't wash hands. They can't social distance. You're just killing them, you know? So these guys are, may succeed in this. I mean, people are in court trying to stop them and things, but, but if they succeed, the only consolation, well, the two consolations will be one, the Keystone fight proved to people you could stand up to big oil. And now every project gets fought and fought hard and we win a lot of them. And the other consolation is at least they are demonstrating precisely and without any equivocation who they are. You know, the right. kind of people for whom literally the only thing that matters on earth is money. And and they will and and so one hopes we come out of this able to to able to see more clearly. There's no silver lining to a pandemic, but if we're gonna go through this much trauma so many people are going through deep trauma, then at least we should be able to learn something as a society. And I suspect we are. I suspect that people are learning, one, that those, those, that what we talked about before about delay and how dangerous it is. And two, sort of even more bedrock than that, I think people are learning that physical reality is real which is an easy thing to forget when you're surrounded by screens, you know? I've spent 30 years trying to convince people that physics and chemistry are real and that you can't spin and the CO2 molecule and you can't, you know, negotiate with it or ask it to compromise or whatever. You just have to stop producing it. Uh, and now we're learning the same thing about biology. You know, it didn't work when our, our, our dear leader uh, stood up there and, told the, you know, COVID microbe that it was a hoax or not a big deal, just like the flu or whatever. It didn't care. It just kept doing it. I mean, the world is real. And so we need to be very, very real in response to it. Yeah, it, it still means that we are having to be really creative about our response in this moment. And I think the one of the local projects that has really been in a focus of advocacy for climate activists in Massachusetts has been the Weymouth Compressor Station. and Which I understand they're continuing to do construction exactly. on. Right I mean, now. That's, that's beyond belief. The idea that anyone would consider that critical or essential work. It's not like we need more gas and oil. We're drowning in this stuff at the moment. I mean, you can't give it away. Uh, the idea that you would be sending people out and calling that essential work. Uh, uh, when we've shut down every other damn thing in this society. Yeah. Is While enforcing, and you know, and we're enforcing on ourselves as well, but making sure to enforce the social distancing yes. provisions that would prevent any protesters well, from yes. being part of it, even even standing however, whatever distance apart. So um, I do it. So when I look down over here, I'm looking at the laptop that has questions and live comments. Um, so someone had asked, is it time now? Are questions welcome now here? Yes, please, please put your questions. I'll, I'll bring them in. Uh, so speaking of the Weymouth compressor station, uh, there is a question from Nathan Phillips, who is one of our uh, I'll, I'll professors credit in the area. Nathan Phillips for his great work in making people really understand that Weymouth compressor station, and I'm very that was a really uh, brave thing that he did. Nathan embarked on a hunger strike, and and got us some real progress in that and again put himself on the line his question you know we talked a little bit about this before you alluded to it what's the opposite of disaster capitalism and where can we see and act on the opportunities before us so again talking about that connection between money and politics and now this intersection where we will need a recovery but who gets that recovery and who's taking advantage of this moment to rush in and establish themselves what's the opposite of that well, the opposite of disaster capitalism is using moments for the general good, you know, seizing moments. And, and it's not as if we haven't seen that in the past, you know. I mean, at the end of World War II with the world in ruins, the Marshall Plan uh, allowed the rebuilding of, of Europe and, and we saw the result, you know, peace and prosperity uh, uh, there and here. Um, so it's very clear that the, the current equivalent 
to that is something like the Green New Deal, some version of taking this moment and saying, look, we have to build lots and lots of renewable infrastructure because we obviously have to shut down coal and gas and oil as fast as we can. But beyond that, we have to think about who it is in what it is that we value in our societies. I mean, there's lots and lots of low carbon work, care work, you know, uh, 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 people caring for each other. Teachers are low carbon workers. So are domestic uh, uh, care workers and home health aides. So are, you know, all the people that, that we're now discovering are essential workers that we weren't even willing to pay a minimum wage to, you know, six months ago. So, um, um, those are the things that's, you know, that's where, how we have to reorient our politics. And, 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 and it's possible that this is one of these moments. I mean, look, this is, I, I'm, I'm in my 60th year. This is the biggest disruption to life, normal life in those six decades by a large margin, you know, that, that I can remember. And, and, Maybe it will be enough to cause us to think, huh, yeah, uh, uh, it was not what we're doing. The other option, of course, is that everyone will just be so eager to get back to normal that we'll just put all the pins back up in the bowling alley, you know. Mm -hmm. um, that's the other option, and I sure hope that we will, I mean, we will work very hard to try and keep that from happening. Yeah, so um, we'll try to post some resources as well. I know that several of the architects behind the Green New Deal are pushing for a green stimulus mm -hmm. as well at the federal level. And the 350 has been really pushing for just recovery and right. um, everything that's involved with it. That's right. For the, I mean, in the immediate moment, one of the things that makes no sense is uh, just bailing companies out without any attempt to, to change their behavior. And we have good precedent here. You'll recall that it was in the wake of the, um, 2008 financial crisis with the auto companies on their knees that the Obama administration did bail them out and in return demanded this commitment to really serious increases in automobile mileage. Probably the most useful thing that the Obama administration did about, I had some problems with the Obama administration over the years on climate change. That was a very useful thing that they did. And they were able to do it only because they were in a moment of extremists, you know, and we're in another one. So if an oil company or a, you know the airline or whatever wants a bailout, the or a bank for that matter, because they're now at the heart of this problem, yeah. one of the conditions should be show us that you can meet these Paris climate targets, you know that the whole world agreed on. Now of course our country has now abrogated its commitments under the Paris Climate Accord. Um, this is you know a reminder of the incredible foolishness of electing Donald Trump. And it's a hard day, you know, right now, especially, yeah. especially for us Vermonters to watch yeah. uh, Bernie out of the race. On the other hand, it is, this is not a moment for pretending that everybody's alike and they're all the same and so on and so forth. It's a moment for recognizing that we have got to make some change now and we have to do it. I mean, in the real world, not in, Twitter world. Yeah, we had several questions ahead of time about November and what this means. And, you know, you mentioned that it was under the federal uh, administration that they were able to push for some of these changes. And we certainly, you know, we see where we are now, given the, the current, um, you know, so lack of leadership. And um, as of yesterday, now, you know, no progressive left in, in the race at all. Uh, so just in terms of pure um, thinking about exercising our demo democratic muscles again from now until November, how should we be thinking about organizing and strengthening, particularly those who prioritize climate change or climate activism? I'll say two things. It seems to me that there are two. I mean, we're at the point now, because we've waited so long, when we need big institutional action. So it's important to make individual changes. And we've all learned in the last month that we can make a lot of individual changes and, and many of them are okay, you know? Like we're learning that we can Zoom instead of get on airplanes. That's a useful thing to know. Um, but we also need big structural change. And there are two places where that can come from. 
One of them is political system and the other is the financial system. It's an election year. So it's a really important year in, for that political system. Um, right. It doesn't mean that you that if you can't elect the person that you think was the absolute best person, that therefore you should walk away from or or act out of petulance or whatever. I mean, I was saying before, I you know there were plenty of places where I disagreed with Barack Obama, but I knew that because he was there it was worthwhile going and trying to force him to change. I organized, helped organize the biggest demonstrations outside the White House during the Obama era around this Keystone stuff. There's no point in doing it with Trump because it doesn't matter how much pressure you put on him, he's not a changeable human being, you know? He's just a tool. And so, you know, if we don't get our first choice, then our second choice has got to be someone that at least we can push and 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 i think that's pretty obvious so it's going to be a lot of hard work between now and november to make sure that happens second big lever and the one i've spent the most time on in the last year or so is the financial system yeah. um, it's not like they're completely distinct but they're not the same thing um mm -hmm. and, I th and as it turns out there's a lot of reason to think that pushing on Wall Street may be at least as useful as pushing on Washington. Um, you know, if we can get them to act, A, it happens quickly, which is not something that political systems ever do, and B, it happens globally. Our financial markets are entwined in a way that our you know, Washington, mostly for the better, no longer runs the whole world, but Wall Street still kind of does. So we might as well take some advantage of that. That's why we've been working so hard on uh, on the big banks, the big insurance companies, the big asset managers. And we've had some real successes. Uh, BlackRock, the biggest asset manager in the world, one dollar in every eight on this planet sits in their digital vaults. Okay. We were able to force them to make pretty sweeping commitments around climate change in January. Uh, Liberty Mutual there in Boston uh, has been the big target of, uh, 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 of campaigners on the insurance front around climate change. They've made some beginning changes, nowhere near enough. And I'm afraid it emerges this week that Liberty Mutual may be backing the Keystone pipeline, maybe providing mm -hmm. insurance for it, which is a great sadness and something that Bostonians should be on top of and pushing hard on. Um, um, banks, I was telling you before, we were really hopeful that on April on Earth Day, we'd be able to have civil disobedience in the lobbies of several thousand Chase Bank branches around the country. We can't do that now, but 50 million Americans have a Chase credit card in their wallet, and every one of them has a pair of scissors in their kitchen drawer. And, you know, it's not like, you know, it's not like you can't find another credit card. I mean, we're in the middle of a financial crisis. So if you can't find credit someplace else, don't cut yours up just yet. But if you got four cards sitting in that wallet anyway, it's time to say, we're not going to be part of this particular scam. So pulling those political and financial levers at the biggest levels is crucially important. And then, then we're all citizens of the globe and that's the financial system. We're all cities, citizens of our country and that's our presidential election. But we also all live in cities and towns and states. So the work that people are doing in places like Boston, the work that you are doing in particular in Boston is absolutely crucial to helping us see the way forward. It's not that we can solve climate change one city at a time, but as cities demonstrate that change is not only mm -hmm. possible, but desirable, then we get, then we build momentum, then we undercut the power of the fossil fuel industry. So we're incredibly grateful to you for the leadership there. It's, it's exactly what we've been thinking about in Boston. There are, you know, there's the, the, the potential when we have a city with, res with you know, relative resources, but still deep inequities to demonstrate what is possible when we, all c when we lift everyone up and focus with equity as, as the, the primary lens in thinking about not just this particular crisis, but the ones that unfortunately inevitably will come. You know, I'm looking down and seeing there's a whole side conversation on the comment section about the, the specific tie between coronavirus and climate change that um, 
as we as the planet is warming and as the animals and insects that are more likely to carry disease are are you know expanding due to temperature as we are encroaching on animal habitats these types of you know what are called zoonotic diseases that can jump from animal to human and cause sweeping pandemics because none of us have immunity that will increase as climate change moves forward well yes and, and that kind of thing is already dramatically on the increase i mean uh I mean, vector-borne disease of all kinds is expanding rapidly because, you know, if you were trying to build a world that insects liked, a warm, wet world would be the answer. Uh, mosquitoes were expanding their range dramatically. I remember being in Bangladesh doing reporting when they had their first big outbreak of dengue fever, which the World Health Organization says is the emergent disease of our century. Mm. Uh, I was spending a lot of time in the slums, so I eventually got bit by the wrong mosquito myself, and I was as sick as I'd ever been. But look, I mean, I was healthy and strong and well-fed going in, so I didn't die. Lots of people did die, just like lots of people died from Zika virus. Uh, I mean, think about that Zika virus. We've sort of tended to, to put it in the back of our minds now. But three or four years ago, the health ministers of five nations told women in their countries not to have babies for the next two years because of this uh, Zika virus that was spreading around. Think about New England. Where I live, and really all across rural New England, suburban New England, the spread of uh, a tick-borne Lyme disease over the last 10 years has dramatically altered people's psychology and lives. People no longer feel easy about going off into the woods for a walk or letting their kids play in the grass at the park because they understand that that now can produce a truly nasty and 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 difficult disease because ticks expand their range as the temperature warms we also should be really clear as we think about coronavirus you know this is not the only thing in the world that goes after people's lungs um, i was in delhi not that long ago one of my favorite cities in the world but in recent times its air quality has gotten so terrible that it's an almost impossible place to live. There are 5 million children in Delhi, and we think that at least 2.5 million of them have irreversible lung damage simply from breathing the air. So now that we're fixated correctly on what it means to have, you know, you're be unable to breathe correctly because something's wrong with your lungs, we should be reminding ourselves that that's the everyday fate of many hundreds of millions on this planet and and again obviously it i mean look there's people of all kinds get asthma in america but the people who get it the most are the people who have to live near highways and refineries and uh, and we know who those people are you know it's no great mystery absolutely so i want to wrap up and um the last kind of batch of there's several questions about this idea of what should we take from this current experience that connects to our climate advocacy, you know, potentially after COVID. Um, the, the question I wanted to end on came from Kate, who had asked, how do we not give up? It was a simple question, but I think in some ways it's the same as that, that whole, whole idea is that yeah. we don't give up now because we see that this is really highlighting and shedding light on a whole set of um, not just issues that need to be solved as you lifted up, but the potential to solve them in a way that addresses so many of the challenges we're facing. Uh, I'm always biased that the local level is where you could do that very quickly and with community truly embedded in grassroots activism. Um, but I'll, I'll kick that to you as a last question. How do we not give up? Well, I mean, we don't give up because we're human beings and and we, you know, have great affection for each other. And so we fight. <laughs> that said, you know, it's really worth remembering that questions like climate change come with a time limit. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, our climate scientists around the world, told us in 2018, if we had not made huge strides, fundamental transformations by 2030, and they defined that as cutting emissions about in half, then the chance of meeting the targets we set in Paris were forever by the board. You know, we, we couldn't meet them. So I'm not, I actually not, telling you that um, that that we're going to go on 
fighting forever. I mean, there may come a time when the scientists just say, look, we waited too long and now this thing's out of control, you know, but that's not yet. We've got 10 years of enormous leverage left here where we can have enormous effect on how bad this is going to be. And one way to look at it, Councilor Wu, is that I, what we're trying to do as activists, as politicians, we're trying to change the odds here some. Um, we know that none of the things that any of us can do is enough to solve the problem that we face. But we're trying to change the odds here. And the stakes of this wager are so enormous that changing the odds even a little bit is well worth a life's work. So I just, let me just end by saying such thanks to you and such thanks to everybody on this. I'm just looking through the chat myself and recognizing people's names and knowing just how hard, I mean, uh, Massachusetts has been at the absolute center of this fight uh, from the beginning. And so, you know, the people who have uh, uh, blocked pipelines in West Roxbury and the people who have, uh, you know, uh, rallied in every corner of the state and the people who are trying hard to force the state of Massachusetts to divest its pension holdings from fossil fuels and the people in the faith community who have done so much and the people in the environmental justice community who've been working hard on this for 20 years now. I mean, all of them are just, I mean, such thanks to everybody. If we have a chance here, it's everybody coming together um, uh, in that kind of spirit of solidarity. And um, we'll see. In the meantime, stay safe and, and just such thanks for your work. Thank you so much, Bill. Thank you to everyone who tuned in. Stay updated, stay connected with us as we're continuing in Boston to think about the immediate triage and what we need to do for public health, but also plan for that equitable recovery and continue building the, the coalitions that will make that possible. So uh, we know we'll see you back in Boston Absolutely. soon enough. And thank you again, Phil. All right. Bye.